Okay, so this is the free class video about Confucianism. And we're going to talk about it in terms of humanism. It's a kind of humanism because the goal is to try and cultivate the capabilities of as many people as possible to the highest level possible and have a stable society. Um, all right, so the number of pages, the page reading for um, these two classes are, first of all, for the first day of class, there's uh, the scan, the first scan is, wait a second, the first scan is 28 pages. And then there's, so the first scan is 28 pages. And then you can look at the outline and you can look at some of the quotes for tomorrow. And then the second day uh, for Friday, you read, this has um, 16 pages. This one has eight pages. And then there's some news articles. So that's what we've got for the this week, the rest of this week. Um, so here's the outline. Let me go over this. It's about uh, wisdom literature is about integrating that very primitive part of our psyche into the culture. So sex and pleasure and um, aggression, violence. And they're all necessary. They're based on survival. So they're very, very deep seated. And um, they can easily go to extremes and then destroy civilization. So we have to create a civilization that will integrate those drives. So um, in early on, as civilization evolves, first of all, children learn by imitation and habit. And then there's a slow recognition that they have choice. And then people deliberately, consciously start constructing societies. Um, so Confucius lived at a time when civilization had collapsed, truly, completely collapsed. And they gave, Houston Smith gives this example of the conquered were boiled to death and the relatives were forced to drink the human soup. I mean, that's pretty bad. That's about as low as you can go. So what should you do when you have a huge disruption? And you, you could compare this to 9-11, to the economic collapse, and then to COVID. So in your life, there will be more disruptions. So how do you deal with it? Or how does a good leader deal with it? What are the options? And so the realists think, you know, use force, just force people into compliance, and then you'll get law and order, right? We need more law and order rewards and punishments, and whatever the leader says is right, right? Nobody questions it. There's no critical thinking. <laughs> There's just obedience because we've got to have order. Um, it, it assumes people are incapable of governing themselves and they have to be forced into it. And it works, but it only worked for one generation because people do get tired of being uh, beaten up all the time or threatened. So governments have to provide meaning and purpose. They have to motivate people and the people have to trust them. And then people will step up and protect their government. They have to want to preserve the political order because they have to have something at stake. They have to feel like they're better off. Um, if too much force is used, there's no common will and no desire to preserve the order. So the other extreme, that's being too cynical and you thinking force will solve it. The other extreme is love, right? All we need is love, okay? So what we need is empathy, mutual love, and we can change things that way, right? Um, okay, and the problem with that is that it's too simplistic. Um, Confucius thought that they were too utopian and he thought that the realists were too cynical. So what about our founding fathers? 
what would Confucius have said about them? Um, and this is unique about our country, and it's important to know. They were creating a science of government for the first time ever. So it's the most traditionless society history has known. People came from Europe. I mean, of course, there were the Native Americans and, um, and that's a dark spot, plus bringing slaves is a dark spot. Um, the Europeans came over and they wanted to leave behind the old country and they wanted to create a new country and they wanted to give up class distinctions. They really tried to minimize the tradition and to create the science of government where people are treated as free and equal and they use their reason, right? It, they has proposed reason. Remember when even the Athenians, right? You trial by jury and voting in the assembly, you're, su you're supposed to use your reason. Um, but America is even more radical because people left Europe and came here. So they're really trying to reconstruct human nature in this way based on reason. Okay, Confucius, it probably wouldn't occur to him but if it had, he would have dismissed it because he assumes the mind operates in a context of attitudes and emotions that are conditioned by group relationships. He doesn't agree with rugged individualism. We aren't individuals like that. We need each other. So it's a much more socially oriented point of view. Um, you have to condition people to cooperate then they might use their reason. But if you don't condition them and teach them how to be with groups, they'll just use their reason to gain for personal gain. Then it will be a doggy dog society. So what did he decide on? Okay, he decided on what Houston Smith calls deliberate tradition. So he very deliberately constructed a view of the good old days in China, <laughs> the golden age. So what he's doing is he's saying, what you see in front of your eyes is not a real Chinese. This is not the real China. The real China was back in the age of the great harmony during the Chao dynasty. And we are capable of that. And that's who Chinese really are. So he didn't try a literal return. He's not literally <laughs> describing the facts. He's, he's deliberately idealizing it and he's trying to modify it to fit his own times. Um, tradition was the device for appropriating some image of this past. And so people would think if I'm really Chinese, I'm going to be civilized and get along. Now, you could think about how people in America idealize the past back in the good old days. And like, I, I don't agree with that because I'm a woman in philosophy. And back in the good old days, I never would have been able to be a woman in philosophy, among other things. Um, there's lots of things like we have better race situations between the races. It's still very fraught and very institutionalized, but nobody would want to go backwards on race or sex or sexual orientation, or there's a lot of things we have definitely moved forward on, but people do idealize and romanticize the past. So you can think about that. If somebody you know does that, you can mention it in class. But Confucius really made an art out of this, and this is what he was famous for. Um, he was using the past, okay. Um, he shifted tradition from unconscious to conscious. So he was a social genius. Like he knew what to say. He knew where the touch points were. He knew how to present himself as an icon. Um, in a lot of ways, it was the Analects were put together, I think after he was dead. And so, um, it's 
idealization of Confucius. What I would say is he's mythologized. So Jesus uh, and Socrates, they're all mythologized, which is a compliment. It doesn't mean it's a lie. It means you pick the quotes and the stories that best represent the way of life of these people. And this is the kind of thing this person said in this kind of situation. This is the kind of situation this person got into because this is the best way of life. Um, so what he did was he set up this very controlled, right, uh, society based on internalizing Confucian values. So everything was unity, the great harmony. And then um, children at school, they would, they would stand up and say, all human beings are by nature good. So it's, that's your starting point. And then you keep raising a kid, habituating a kid to think people are by nature good. And literally, they become good. Um, this is notes on the Founding Fathers, which is an article you read for, for Friday. But what was Confucius' life like? Um, he, he decided to take um, the long trek. OK, so he was an orphan. He was not a privileged person. He considered himself a failure because he always wanted to be hired as a political advisor. He wanted to advise political leaders so that they would not abuse their power. And he never got hired to do it. Or if he did, they were just using him to look good. They weren't actually taking his advice. Um, anyway, he was a great teacher and he was a Socratic teacher. That's interesting. He asked his, his disciples, he had these close friends, um, questions, well, what do you think? Or things like that. So that's what he was famous for. He was humble about his own abilities. Um, so was Socrates. He was homey. Um, and he was concerned for the common person. He had democratic instincts. Um, he had a sense of mission, obviously. Um, he made high demands on himself. He had integrity. And then at age 50, he decided to take the long trek. So he went all around China. Um, you know, Jesus uh, got baptized by John, and that was in, when he was 32. And then he went um, out into the wilderness, and he came back, and he started his ministry. Um, he tried to get hired, he was ignored, and then he came home and he edited the classics and then he died. And then after he died, people edited the Analects and they became an addition to the classical tradition. So um, what is what are the Analects? Well, it's a prototype of what the Chinese hope the Chinese character will become. He didn't write any of them. They were compiled after he died. Well, what is this prototype? Um, the ideal relationship. So relationships are fundamental to who you are. Um, you focus on each other's humanity and a sense of dignity. Um, and so, you know, you can pick these quotes or think of these quotes. I have another attachment with quotes. Learning without thinking leads to confusion. Thinking without learning is dangerous. So in a way, this class is trying to get you to learn stuff, right? You read something, and then you think about it. Um, all right. Traditional values, the golden rule. It's very amazing what, um, what is criteria what comes up in the Analects. Um, and I will, I've got some quotes on the other, other um, attachment, but these are just sort of the cheat sheet, right? Seek knowledge, find soulmates, 
be unaffected by popularity. Don't worry about what they think. Um, all right. The, the issue here, what he was trying to build society on was five constant relationships. And they're all based on inequality and authority. So husband, wife, parent, child, elder sibling, younger sibling, you're responsible to be a mentor, elder friend, younger friend, uh, ruler subject, and the family is most basic. So this obviously is very different from um, the West with the emphasis on equality. Um, especially when it comes to friends, right? <laughs> so everything here is unequal. Um, all right. Confucius as a character was that human beings need a role model. And so the story of Confucius served psychologically as a role model. Someone who is completely civilized, we should learn uh, we should imitate Confucius. And then you can also, I mean, next you have to tie it with reason. That's the next thing. And that's, you know, how many Confucian, how many Chinese people just imitate without going past that to critical thinking? And how many of them actually do that self-examination? Um, he was very much, very Socratic. Um, he loved to transmit antiquity, talk about the old days and the days, the golden age of China. Um, all right, let's see. He, he also he even had a section about culture. So it was very important to like music. Um, they have a magical power, the arts power to transform human nature in the direction of virtue. So that's an important part of civilization. Um, all right. So the question here is, is Confucianism really a religion or is it an ethic? And it's a way of life woven about, around people's concerns. Um, it doesn't focus on some transcendent ground, uh, some supernatural God. It focuses more on relating to each other. You have respect for your ancestors, um, but you also, I mean, you respect them and then you respect the people in front of you and you respect your elders. So that's the continuation. It's just this constant um, harmonizing of relationships. What has been its impact on human history? Uh, well, the question, you know, Houston Smith asks is, well, who has the most impact? Is it somebody who tries to conquer the world? Well, politically, militarily, economically, that's short-lived. Um, really creating a creed. So Confucius, in his, you know, very humble, just picture of this, a uh, humble man who was just happened to be virtuous. Um, his ideas were extremely powerful and had an incredible effect on a, a large number of human beings for a long time. Um, 2000 years over one fourth of the global population. Charles Darwin thought that Confucius had a great model for civilization. So this is important because we think of Darwin, I think the standard uh, idea is social Darwinism means dog eat dog, um, competitive and adversarial. Uh, capitalism is just sort of social Darwinism is winner take all, money sticks the money. That is not true. It isn't what Darwin thought. But it is interesting that Darwin thinks Confucius had the best model because that Obviously, this model is not what we associate with the West. Um, all right. And so with their one-child policy, China started forcing a one-child policy. They've let up on it a little bit lately. But they were able to bring many, many people into the middle class 
I think, uh, I think it's like one or two United States, right? 600 million people they were able to bring, lift up into the middle class. And that's important because that will make you loyal <laughs> to your government if you personally have a story that you benefited from the government's leadership, right? Um, so is Confucius, how does Confucius relate to us? How does it compare to our own attitudes? Um, and would it be a good um, antidote or a good balancing out compared to what we have? Does, does America lack civility in public life? And so we need to work on that more. Um, how does our, so how does our political situation arise from a different cultural tradition? So to what extent can we really find some kind of common humanity? And to what extent is conditioning really deep? Now, when we covered women's rights, and uh, race and gender orient sexual orientation, you could say that deep down, you know, every little girl, every kid of a uh, different race, they understand intuitively that they're no different from this other person. So to what extent can that intuition uh, govern conditioning or to what extent is are people just really deeply conditioned one way or another way and then what do you do moving forward trying to construct because every generation needs to try to get a vision of moving the country forward during their time that's why I want you to write a worldview it isn't just about you it's about if you have this idea what sort of relationships are you going to have? How are you going to talk about good and evil, justice and injustice? What are you going to look for as you lead? Because you will have to lead the uh, herding of cats. You will have to lead our society in another decade or two. Um, all right. So this really difference between Americans and Chinese on uh, the importance of relationships, especially people you don't know personally. Um, all right. And there's some quotes. Um, okay, so that's what we have there. Then, oh, here are the, the quotes from the analects. And I couldn't find where I had scanned the intellects. I think I have it somewhere, but on the other hand, I'm asking you to read an awful lot. So I did ask you to buy the intellects. Um, so I hope you did. At least I think I did, but that's all right. This is, you can look at these and think about them. So come to class having read these and come with, well, what ones do you like particularly? and why, right? So I, the assignment would be, you need to react to something from the reading and then also to something from these analects. There's the golden rule, uh, that's interesting. Transfer your mind from feminine allurement. Okay, that sounds like self-control, temperance. Uh, four of the characteristics, he was serious, he was deferential to his superior. He was beneficent, generous, and um, he was just. So that would be rule for the well-being of the ruled. What is wisdom to devote yourself to your duty to humanity and respecting the spirits of the departed? Okay. Puts the man of virtue puts duty first. All right. So again, I don't have to read all these out loud. Uh, you can read them, but you could just give this idea of what do you think of this overall ethic? Um, okay, I ideally examine myself, so he lives an examined life. Uh, what does it mean to be a scholar? So this is 
in, uh, in China. Uh, kids have a lot of pressure to do well in school and they, no child is left behind when it comes to being monitored by relatives and also doing well in school. And then another thing Confucianism has is there's different phases in life. So you don't emphasize individualism. You emphasize, well, at different stages in your life, you're focused differently and your relationships will be different. And so it, it really looks more at the organic side of human beings, not this abstraction of individuality. So at 15, so at 15, you're supposed to accumulate knowledge, study, learn, uh, start learning, accumulating all this stuff. Because when you go out in the world, you're going to have to be focused on just the things, knowing the things you need to know to make a living, raising your kids, all this other stuff. So you do need to focus on education when you're young. At 30 um, is when most people, the standard life uh, trajectory is you have a spouse, you have kids, you're trying to get a job, trying to establish a career. You just, okay, uh, all this stuff going on. At 40, you sort of get it together. You just kind of establish stuff. Now, this is very interesting because in Confucius, that's when your life starts coming together. Whereas in America, the standard thing is the midlife crisis, and that's where everything falls apart. So you should think about that because is the reason everything fell apart because you didn't have the right foundation in the first place? Um, and what should our foundation be so that when you are 40, you don't just say, I've, I'm going to start all over, or I don't like this. I do think that's why I do keep emphasizing you should find something you're passionate about. Um, but again, I know that, that there's a lot of other qualifications, so I don't necessarily want you to starve in the street or anything, but people in general who thought about what they were passionate about chose something related to that. I think in general are less likely to have that midlife crisis. Some of that crisis is I never did anything I really wanted to do. I always did what I was supposed to do. But, you know, it varies a lot. It's just that that is interesting to me, is that the difference between having your life come together and having it blow apart. So at 50, you start to understand um, heaven. And um, at 60, and then at 70, all right? So it takes you till you're 70 before your heart is really in the right place. All right, I'm 69. I got about 10 months left. <laughs> I don't know. It seems to me I have, still have a way to go. But let's hope for the best, Dr. Beck. Uh, wish me luck. Shall I teach you the meaning of knowledge? When you know to recognize, you know. When you do not know to know, you, you don't know, right? That's exactly what Socrates said. Um, their golden mean, right? somebody's translating this and using the golden mean. So obviously the person who translated it is aware of the Aristotelian tradition and wants to point out the similarities. All right, so, okay, lots of other stuff. And then your propriety, your duty to your parents. Um, and that's... Confucius character, um, and then his conversations with his disciples. Um, he keeps wanting to compare himself with the golden age, right? He doesn't say, follow me. He says, oh, I think about the pang, and I think about how glorious those days were, and I think about how cultivated he was, and it's very inspiring to me, whatever. Um, okay, so cultivation of the person, right, is the main thing. How to rule well. All right. This is very important. If you govern the people by laws and keep them in order with penalties, they'll avoid the penalties 
and lose their sense of shame, right? If you try to force people, you're gonna make them even worse. If you govern them by example and keep them in order by your conduct, then they will be ashamed if they do nasty things and they'll aspire to be more like you and it will weave the society better, together better. Um, all right, let's see. The most important thing for a, a leader to have, there's food, forces, and confidence. And so Confucius says the most important thing is the confidence of the people. And I will say one of the reasons our democracy is in decline, and officially on, there's an international scale, of course, of what kind of government each country has and if it's rising or declining. So the United States has been categorized as a declining democracy. Um, so how does that happen? Well, one of them, one of the reasons is that the confidence of the people, right? People are always complaining about the government and I don't know what they're talking about. Um, I always want to ask them, you know, do you want a minimum wage? Do you want it to be enforced? I'm just never sure what they mean. And sometimes I think people just grow up hearing that. And then of course they have some conflict with the tax system or filling out forms. And then, oh, that's what that's about. So it is really important to figure out, well, where do I think government's okay? And where do I think it overstep? And have some really good reasons based on your own experience or your knowledge of what's going on out there in the world. Um, but when people just say, I hate the government, then you're in trouble, you're in trouble. Um, okay. All right. So I think you can just read this. This is the culture where he talks about falling in love with, he heard some music and he was, uh, he, he couldn't even taste meat, right? It just sort of was, went out of his mind. Um, you should study poetry because it's very good for your soul. <laughs> so I don't know how many of you think if we want to have a good leader that we should study poetry. Um, if our leader doesn't love poetry and the arts, there's something wrong with them. All right. So do you think Confucius has these virtues? I think so. Temperance, courage. He had the courage to to try and get himself in a situation where he was advising leaders, even when he was gonna tell them things they didn't wanna hear. He was generous, generous with his time. He didn't have any money. Um, he was even tempered. He had this ambition that he wanted to go on the long trek and become an advisor. Um, he knew um, how to honor citizens. He knew that what he did was honorable, but he didn't demand honor. He was very humble, but he honored people appropriately, and he understood the importance of that. Uh, he had a sense of humor, and then he had those very close friends, and he was sociable. He didn't uh, create animosity or conflict, um, and he was truthful about himself. Um, he was not greedy, right? He set a standard of simple living. Um, he tried to advise people about how to make laws. He talked about a good ruler, uh, rules mostly by example, not by laws, by threatening uh, to make another law and enforce it with force, right? Um, but he would advise about what a good law is the distribution of wealth and resources. His view really wants people to flourish. Um, but, you know, this is again, another place where the US and China are at odds. But I think if you just find out, we all want to have this middle class, we all wanna maximize flourishing, how do we get there? And China will say, we like our way better and the U.S. says we like our way better, um, and then they provide evidence. So 
for the next class on Friday, we're going to go over some newspaper articles where specifically they talk about that, how to punish someone, right? Again, China and the US. But, but this is where China is affected by Confucianism, but it isn't. You know, Confucius would not advocate um, necessarily what the policies that go on in China, just like Jesus would not advocate uh, US policies. So uh, practical wisdom in each case, knowing what to do, what's best, and then knowledge um, and the intellectual virtues. So, all right, so you can think about that. And that's it for today. And I will see you tomorrow. And I look forward to talking with all of you. And I hope you look forward to listening to each other. Thank you. Bye-bye.